you all for being here. Um, there's been a lot of excitement on campus about this conference. Um, some of my students have been attending sessions and they've been excited. So um, yeah, it's wonderful to have everybody here. Uh, DeBron Thomas is a native of the San Francisco Bay Area. And he moved to Lexington in 2008 to come to the University of Kentucky, where he graduated in 2012 as a journalism major. And after his graduation, he began working as an intern at our own NPR station here, WUKY. He was brought on staff at the station in 2013. His big passions in life are history and storytelling. And he was able to do both in producing two films, The Unghosting of, Me of Medgar Evers and a documentary on the March on Frankfurt. Everybody knows about the March on Washington in 1963, but who knew that there was a March on Frankfurt? Um, he does a weekly feature on local musicians in Lexington called Local Music Monday. And he is also the host of the Crunkadelic Funk Show, which airs every Saturday at 9 p.m. on WUKY. And if, if you listen to the show, you'll recognize his voice instantly. <laughs> Speaking out on social issues is something he's felt it's his duty as a person of color. And in 2016, he founded the Take Back Cheapside Movement. That logo is up here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a coalition of various organizing groups with the goal of removing the Confederate statues located that were located a few blocks away from here at Cheapside, which was the site of a former slave market and a very profitable one here in Lexington. Um, and hopefully we'll hear a little bit about how that uh, played out <laughs> because the story is very exciting. Uh, in addition to producing radio features and organizing, DeBron also spends his time writing and performing rock and soul music. He released his first album, All My Colors Are Blind, two years ago, and he continues to perform regionally with this band. <coughs> so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome DeBron Thomas. <laughs> oh, oh, did I fix it? <laughs> oh, okay. So, I'm a, I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible millennial. Uh, apparently, I don't understand that. Sometimes when you say things, there's a different, there's a separate file. So I was sitting up here freaking out. I'm like, yeah, just keep talking slower. <laughs> um, as slow as I can. Yeah, I told myself that uh, that I was gonna, I was gonna start out and just say, hey, how's it going? I'm John. <laughs> Especially with the radio thing. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is the first building that I was ever in when I came to the UK. Um, I was, uh, was the, it was always real, it was a very interesting time for me to be here in Lexington. I didn't know it at the time, but I showed up in 2008, uh, the, right before the school started. Uh, and I came here and I stayed here with my mom for the, our um, orientation. And the block that is called Center Pit was still there. And when I came back a few months later, it was gone. <laughs> um, and for years, I heard, you know, especially being a musician, I heard, oh man, they took away our culture, they took away our space, and blah, 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 I'm so mad. And when I learned about the history of Cheapside, I was like, you're mad about this, but this <laughs> is like over here. Then I got even more mad because then I learned about how much black history that there used to be at right. that space. Uh, in, uh, so in 1959, there was a Woolworths there, and there was a sit-in here in Lexington that happened right before the one in North Carolina. There was also a black-owned bank, uh, Freedmen Savings and Trust, that was also in that space. And the mayor at the time said, um, at the time that they were demolished, said that there was nothing of consequence in that space. So. Here we go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do this presentation, and um, the last time I did it, I only had half the amount of time that I have now. So I'm going to try to uh, take my time with it, and then um, at the end, if you all have any questions, I can I can do that. Um, most of my friends 
that I've talked to, including Robin, said, oh, you'll have no problem talking for an hour. So, um, so take back cheap side. Um, all right, so basically where this all started for me, uh, my mom is uh, originally from um, Adair County, which is give or take, I don't really know. You just take Nicholasville Road and just go on forever, and eventually you're there. <laughs> um, I, uh, my great-grandfather uh, was uh, Abraham Jones, born in slavery. Um, and so, for me, this has been an issue that has been relatively personal. Uh, and so, I've, in, uh, I've always been like obsessed with learning about history of the civil rights movement, learning about why things are the way they are. I mean, I remember sitting in class um, when I was, in, I was a sophomore in high school, and we were learning about Martin Luther. And I was like, man, that's crazy. He had the same name as this other dude. <laughs> and my teacher was like, yep, we are doomed to, to make the mistakes of the past. And so um, kind of since then, I'd always really wanted to learn about why things are the way they are, why all of our um, issues with oppression all kind of go back to the same place. Um, so uh, for me, one of the biggest influences um, was a teacher that I had in high school who was one of the original members of the Panther Party. And he taught me that they had class every weekend. They had class every night. And you couldn't even call yourself a Black Panther unless you had been in their class for six months. Um, and learning of all the things that they did that were later co-opted by the government, like when I told somebody that Meals on Wheels was started by the Black Panther Party, uh, and you know, and then you know, sickle cell anemia testing. Um, but anyways, so all of that really just opened my eyes to how things were connected. So going to where this movement starts it goes all the way back to 2013. So Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012. And I have many times called him the Emmett Till of our generation. Um, there are plenty of people that, there were plenty of people that came before him, plenty of people that came after him, including Oscar Grant, um, who was uh, killed by a police officer in Bart in Oakland. Um, and so I felt like I spoke out a lot. Um, and in 2013, here in Lexington, there were conversations that started to happen after George Zimmerman was, by all intents and purposes, acquitted of, uh, you know, let go of, of, of being a murderer. And these conversations started, but you can't really start talking about other things without looking at yourself. So this kind of brought Cheapside kind of into the conversation. Um, and so there were these two things that were started by Bianca Spriggs, who, if you are not familiar, she's a African-American poet who was here for a very long time, and unfortunately, she, like many people in Lexington, left. Um, I'm hoping that she comes back because uh, she is an amazing poet, uh, an amazing artist, and um, if you are not familiar with her work, please do so. She's absolutely amazing. And she helped facilitate some conversations in 2013 after the Trayvon, uh, the, the George Zimmerman verdict, and um, in 2015 after uh, the, what happened with Dylan Roof. And there were two main things that kind of happened about this was that people started talking about cheap side. So in June of 2015, someone spray painted Black Lives Matter on the John Morgan side, uh, statue. And then about a month later, someone damaged the historical marker that was put up in 2003 by the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. Um, that told of the space as a slave auction block. Uh, so then in 2015, Mayor Gray um, said that he requested to what is called the Urban County Art Review Board, which is a group of people within the community um, of all different levels, whether it be academic or even uh, personal artists and architects and engineers, uh, to decide what was going to happen with this space. So they had two different, um, they had two different um, uh, get-togethers. One was uh, something that was put together by Bianca at the Carnegie Center, and then they had another actual meeting at, at City Hall. 
And when I showed up to this meeting at the Carnegie Center, like everybody was awesome. There were people that were there that were mad. There was this old lady that tried to talk about how great Jefferson Davis was. And there were like even more people that were like, this is wrong. And I'm like, all right, we're going to get somewhere. And then when I showed up to the meeting in September that was at the city council meeting, uh, where the city council meets, I was the youngest person in the room at 26. I'm 28 now. And I was like, where were all these people? Like, why did you, like this is not that far from the Carnegie Center. Um, and also the meeting was at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So that probably could have played to it. Um, so I started complaining about it very much, very loudly on social media. And so folks will ask me, yeah, the movement kind of started in, in June of 2016, but I say that a lot of this goes back to these conversations. And so um, in November of 2015, the UCAR came back and said uh, their recommendations were to remove the statues and bring back the plaque, which was kind of a controversial issue because just because it was not down, all of a sudden it was part of this conversation, even though they're apples and oranges, or more like oppressive eggs and non-oppressive eggs. Um, and so then, in all months, uh, in, in all months, February of 2016, Mary Gray came back and said that the statues were going to stay and be added with historical context. And that's when I got mad. Um, <laughs> Because I'm already, I'm already low-key upset that Black Panther is coming out in February. Like, I'm hyped for it, but I'm, I just also know that somebody at Marvel was like, we should release this movie in February. It's really going to get the people out. Um, so anyways, take back Cheapside. And I promise this is the only picture of me in this entire thing. I'm not that vain. Um, so our first actions... Uh, started following the deaths of Philander Castile and Alton Sterling in 2016. Um, I found myself being on social media trying to have these conversations and trying to get people to come over to the aisle and say, look, like, this is not just an isolated incident. How many more people have to die for us to stand together and recognize that things are wrong and we need to stand to fix them? Um, and so I um, was kind of strategically, my hero when it comes to organizing is a guy named Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was a uh, leader of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. And he was very strategic in how he was able to get people to organize because he created what is called the Rainbow Coalition. And the original Rainbow Coalition, not what Jesse Jackson co-opted, the original Rainbow Coalition, which was a group of um, oppressed groups. So together with this gentleman named Bob Lee, um, Fred Hampton went to uh, Appalachian Whites, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, women's movement, the Native American movement. There was a, a group of folks from Kentucky called the Young Patriots. Uh, there was a Puerto Rican gang from Chicago called the Young Lords, and basically the pitch to them was, we are all being oppressed by the same power structure, so while you might not like me, we need to work together to make change. And so that's kind of how I went about organizing this campaign. So I reached out to members of Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, uh, showing up for racial justice, the local chapter of the NAACP, uh, and various folks within the community to create a coalition uh, you know, with the, the sole purpose of, you know, making this space inclusive for all people. Because I never felt comfortable going down there. And I don't know if either of you, or if any of you, have ever been down to Thursday Night Live, but it is not a very welcoming situation for people of color. Um, and ironically enough, one of the hardest things that I dealt with, with talking to people in the community, was specifically older people of color, uh, didn't really want to join in this because, not because they didn't care, but because they didn't believe that it was possible, they didn't believe that it was worth their effort and energy. Um, and so we pressed on. And so um, we did, uh, received all kinds of training from some, some allies around town, did power mapping, which is a form of organizing where you literally put folks on a map and list how important they are to what you're trying to accomplish. 
And then on the other side of it, you know, it's the you list the people who are against you and the detractors. Um, so, and you know, we had some had some had some uh, core group of, of folks that uh, were really important to the movement. So, building pressure. So basically, what I did was I went to uh, I went and did the same presentation to Surge KFTC and members of KWL. Did the same thing with. Uh, the Lexington NAACP. And the first time we had a protest at Thursday Night Live, I made the mistake of saying, all right, y'all, like, make some signs and I'll see you there. And I show up and I'm the only one with a sign. So, <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, that was, that, was, that was an interesting thing that I'll get to in a minute. But um, to use a quote from Fred Hampton, uh, education is an extremely important thing, especially when we're living in this world of alternative facts. And so Fred Hampton once said, without education, people will accept anything. Without education, what you'll have is neocolonialism, instead of the colonialism like you have now. Without education, people don't know what they're doing. People don't know what they're doing. You might get people caught up in an emotionalist movement. You might get them because they're poor and they want something. And if they're not educated, they want more. Before you know it, you'll have Negro imperialism. And Fred Hampton was a real smart guy. Um, so much so that he was assassinated by the United that's States right. government. But that's a, another situation. So for me, what I did was I was like, all right, I need to make sure that when I go into this space, I know the history of this space. Uh, so I met with historians. I did all kinds of research. I can tell you more about the courthouse than you probably want to know. One of the most obtrusive things, I think, is that this, at least in Lexington, there's this continued trend of like leaving out black history, like look at horse racing. I don't like it because it comes right from slavery. Um, and it was one of those things where when the people in power realized that black folks were good at being jockeys, they barred us from being jockeys. The first 15 of the first 28 Kentucky Derby winners were black. If you ever drive on Oliver Lewis Way, um, that was named after the first Kentucky Derby winner. Isaac Murphy was a black man who is the most decorated uh, jockey, and he has records that still aren't broken. And he died in the early 20th century. Um, so anyways, part of it was meeting with historians and doing your research, because without the education and without the knowledge, you might be able to bring an emotional plea, but if you don't have that bit of, you know, je ne sais quoi, as they say, um, there's going to be, it's going to keep your movement from trying to, you know, be as successful as possible. Um, so, sending a message. So this, uh, the first picture on the, uh, with the dude in the red shirt, that's from the, hey! Everybody bring a sign. And so, of course, because I had a sign that said Black Lives Matter, I was a target. Could have also been the melanin in my skin, but, you know. Uh, and, and so, the difference between this one and then the second picture of the gentleman with the sign, uh, this was after KFTC hosted a sign-making party. And the gentleman in the picture, Chris Woolery, said, you know, I don't have very much to contribute, but I want next time I go down there, I want to hold a sign with what says what it said on the plaque, so that people can sit and read that this space was a slave auction block, and you got people getting drunk, and you got statues of people who fought to keep slavery uh, on the same space, and that really was the the main portion of our argument. Um, I believe, as somebody who appreciates history, I believe that yes. There is a place for Confederate monuments. A museum, primarily, uh, but definitely not having them on a space where slaves were bought and sold. Um, and, and you know, there was one time I was listening to a radio show, and there was a former city council person, and she was talking to some folks in the mayor's office, and she's like, yeah, it's amazing that there, you know, that there's such a mundane history at the courthouse. You know, there's really, it's really awesome that there are tunnels underneath. I wonder where they go. You know what they use those tunnels for? Transporting people that look like me. They used to take them all the way out to the East End. And one of the reasons why when slavery ended, quote unquote, um, freed slaves 
came apart to the north part of Lexington and founded and took over the East End. And they took over the East End mainly because that's where there were a lot of slave jails. So it's a reappropriation of something that was atrocious. Um, and there are some angry white dudes. Uh, there are a lot of those. Um, and um, this gentleman over here, if you, uh, he's the tallest person in the picture on the, on the uh, farther end. Um, well, I guess on the closer end. I don't know. I'm directionally challenged. Uh, this was actually one of the most interesting things that happened to me during this, this entire process was we were at this protest, and this dude walked up and asked, why are you all out here? And somebody told him, we're trying to get these statues moved. Why? Because this is a site of a former slave auction block. Dude puts down his beer, grabs a sign, joins the protest. <laughs> um, so our three-point plan, because again, I love the Panthers. They had a 12-point plan that was originally a 21-point plan. So I was like, I gotta have a point plan. Um, so our three-point plan was to remove the statues, bring back the historical marker, and open up a dialogue to uh, make the space inclusive for all people. Pretty simple and explanatory. Um, and after we met with the mayor for the first time, well, we met with the mayor's people in, two, in December of 2016. When we met with the mayor again, we learned the roadmap of how to remove the statues. We learned the, the block that was the Kentucky Military Heritage Commission. We learned that we had to sway the city council. And the reason why in 2015, Mayor Gray decided to keep the statues and add historical context was because those who were wanting to keep the statues, their voices were the ones that they were hearing the most. Uh, so this is why it's important to organize. Um, and so once we learned of this roadmap, even though it still seemed impossible, it was a much more visual thing. We could actually see like, oh, this is something that's tangible. Um, so, and then, you know, I say facts, facts, facts. Um, you know, talk about, we talked about the lack of black history, like the, the courthouse that was built in 1898. The bricks on the foundation of the courthouse were laid by a black man named Henry Candy. Um, are there any Alpha Phi Alphas in the room? No? Okay, well, Henry Tandy's son, Fertner Woodson Tandy, was one of the founding members of Alpha Phi Alpha, and he was the first African American architect in the state of New York. Things like this are like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. It's like, yeah, so think about this when you're in a space and you see these statues, and that people say, well, they don't really bother me. Well, the more and more that you learn about, like John C. Breckenridge was the uh, only, he was the Vice President of the United States to James Buchanan, but he was the only um, senator to be expelled from, from the Senate because he was, you know, a treasonist person. <laughs> John Hunt Morgan, gosh, don't even get me started on John Hunt Morgan. John Hunt Morgan, this is what this is like white privilege in its, in its finest. John Hunt Morgan raided cities in Ohio, and they named a bridge after him. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, I use this picture uh, in this particular slide because, as you can see, this woman is holding this dude's hand, and this was one of the things. There were small things that happened that empowered us to keep going. There were people who felt that they couldn't speak out. There were people who felt like they couldn't stand with us, but they supported us and they were like, keep going. Uh, so having hope is just as important as having facts. Uh, people power. Um, these are from the city council meeting that I don't really remember. That was a stressful day for me. Um, I got death threats and all kinds of good times having to learn how to use different apps, not feeling like I could stay in my house, uh, you know, all because I want to try to move some statues. Um, so, one of the things within the organizing of this was that we, we had different people cycle through what I call the Take Back Cheap Side Steering Committee. And it, for the most part, was between five and seven people at the, at, at the most. But every single person who came in brought in a different energy. Um, only because you're here, and I'm going to point at you. Robin um, is one of, I, I, like to, I like to refer to her as my lightsaber. 
because she says that she uses her white privilege as a weapon. And she can fit into places that folks won't really, you know, pay her, pay her half a mind. But she's also extremely well organized. I've learned a lot from her. She's been doing a lot of organizing a lot longer than me. And so she was somebody that I was able to really learn from. Uh, also, it helped that part of our, our, our steering committee was not just people of color, and it was a diverse mix of people, um, proving that with the, you know, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. It's a Jimi Hendrix quote. So anyways, um, so we had power building campaigns to try to get people to do different things. And um, I'm a nerd, as you can't tell. I almost actually wore my Star Wars tie, but then I heard my mom say, you gotta look professional. I'm like, but I wanna be Lando. Um, and now I'm like really hyped that Donald Glover's gonna be Lando. That's gonna be like the greatest thing ever. Um, but one of the things I learned through this is that there are people who feel like they can't show up in different ways. So I call this, and it's not mine, but this is just what I refer to it as. I call it the Voltron method. Are you familiar with Voltron? Okay, if you're not, Voltron is a giant robot that is made up of smaller robots. And without any robot, Voltron can't be the defender of the universe. And so even though some people might be the foot, and other people might be the arm that comes with an awesome sword. If you don't have one or the other, you can't move forward and you can't make change. Yeah. So one of the things that we did was uh, we found other ways to engage folks to make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they were committed and connected to this campaign. So we had folks call the mayor's office, call the city council office, um, table with us at events. We had a petition that I really, like that was my breaking point. I was like, man, what's the point of having a petition? That's like getting a like on Facebook. And that's how I feel. And I still feel that way. Right? But it gives people power. It makes people feel like they're connected even if they're all the way in California and they're from Lexington and they want to see this change happen. Um, and then we had people show up to the city council meeting, which is something that the police chief told me was the largest city council showing of city council meeting ever. And um, again, that was a very stressful, it was a very stressful time. But I went viral though, which was pretty cool because Russell and I hugged uh, after they gave the unanimous vote. Um, and so that was, that was nice. Um, and then, you know, there were other pe ways people could be involved in the campaign. Uh, Third Street stuff. Um, was one of the one of it was a real big um, business that helped us raise some money. Uh, we had T-shirts made, um, and there were people who designed logos. I mean, one of the reasons why we were successful is because the folks who were good at things got to do what they were good at. The person who designed our logo was not going to be out in the middle of the street with a megaphone, and you didn't want me designing a logo, right? Um, so, and then another part of this was working with elected officials. Uh, my mom is a big influence on me. And she worked city government for 30, 32 years. She worked to get folks low income housing. She was not a politician, but every politician within the city that she worked in had to respect her and had to learn to work with her if they wanted to get things done. And being a woman of color is already, you're already going to be judged. And so I would spend a lot of time as a kid watching my mom handle officials, deal with microaggressions, even though I didn't know if that's, that's what they were at the time. And, you know, my mom always told me you have to keep working and you got to keep pushing forward. And so that's why part of with this campaign in 2015, I decided to let the UCARB do what they were supposed to do because I was like, well, we trust the system. So very much so it was the same with working with the elected officials. If they said they were going to do something, we held it to them. If they, the minute that they didn't, we had a plan for the escalation. So we met with the mayor, uh, mayor's people right after, actually it was November is what it was right after the election, right after he lost uh, running for Senate. 
And they said, we'll meet with you in the new year. We'll meet with you in January. It was towards the end of January. We sent an email and said, hey, were we still meeting? And they immediately followed up with us. And every step of the way, we held them to what they said they were going to do. Because at least for me, as a person of color, I am not about to get myself in a situation where they're going to point the finger at me and call me an angry black man. Uh, and it's, I, I'm an excitable person, so it's very, it's very easy to confuse. Um, so we always had an escalation plan if it was necessary. And then part of it was learning who to target. Once we learned about the Kentucky Military Heritage Commission, we realized, okay, these people are going to be, this is farther down the line, so let's focus on the folks on city council. Who can we flip? So, met with different people. Started talking to different city council members. <laughs> I think my favorite moment meeting with city council member was I, uh, I met with uh, council member Jake Gibbs, who is the council person for the third district, which is where Cheapside is. And I walked in and I was ready to go. Robin was with me. Robin was my muscle. And um, I was like, all right, so let me tell you about Cheapside. And this is wrong, and this is wrong. And he's like, stop right there. I'm a history professor. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> cool. So this is awkward. Uh, yeah, oh, is that a mint? Um, but there were some conversations that were not that easy. Uh, and learning who to have those conversations with, learning who to show up in that, who had to show up in that meeting, uh, was, were always important. Because especially as a dude, like, I know that patriarchy is a thing. And so, for me, I had to know there were several meetings where I'm like, I'm just going to sit in my arms and let Rob talk. And you know, that's a big part of why this work is important, because it, not only does it, are you working to make change, but you also have to learn about your own privileges. As a black man, I don't have very many, but I do have some. And you know, it's important to understand when you got to step up and when you got to step back. Um, and patience. I think <laughs> it's an important thing, and for me, a lot of because of uh, how this movement happened was a lot of because I got mad. <laughs> got to have a lot of patience. And when I met with Councilman James Brown, who is a person of color, his initial feelings were, "Oh, I don't really care about those statues. They don't mean anything to me." And then after thinking about it, he comes back to me and says, "You know, you really changed my mind." And the, I remember the first time we met with the mayor's pe uh, people, uh, one of the, another gentleman of color, uh, Glenn Brown, who was a deputy CAO, asked if we uh, were just a bunch of, if we were a real organization or if we were just a bunch of friends who had pizza and talked about the issues. <laughs> and so, since the statues have been gone down, uh, Russell Allen, my organizing partner, changed his name on Twitter to Young Pizza Slice. Uh, <laughs> but I do know that when we met with the mayor the first time, he was very much, this is something that's not that important, but I'm going to, you know, we're, we're going to work it out. And then he said, uh, I really like the way that you go, you're go. you going about this. Um, I spent a lot of time with Jim Gray. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that James Brown said was, you, you, need to you just need to change one, one mind. And he changed mine. And I know I changed the mayor's because after Charlottesville, he started saying the exact words that I've been saying for two years. <laughs> Um, especially when he said sacred ground, I was like, oh man, it's my word. Um, so coalition building. Um, this was really important throughout the campaign, and uh, one of the things that I really hope to express to the young people in the room is that all of my heroes in organizing were between the ages of 15 and 22 when they were really digging into work. Fred Hampton was 21 years old when he was assassinated. And he was out here talking about solidarity. He said, you don't fight racism with racism, you fight racism with solidarity. And, you know, this is a gentleman who the government was so afraid of because he, not only was he a panther, but he also had the king mentality of organizing the people. And so part of, you know, solidarity is a word that gets thrown out a lot, but it's not often in practice, it's not a word that is actually done where you have people working side by side. So the same reason, and intersectionality is another word that goes hand in hand. So 
This is why people of color need to stand up for members of the LGBTQ community. This is why people of the LGBTQ community need to stand up for immigrants. And we all need to stand up for one another because we're all being oppressed by the same power structure. And that power structure is white supremacy. Don't get, don't get it twisted. <laughs> like, just because I haven't said it yet, it's white supremacy. Um, and white supremacy comes in many different forms. It comes in the forms of people being tiki, you know, with tiki torches and hoods, and it also comes in the form of, oh, you're so articulate. <laughs> LeBron? Is that, is that your name? Like the basketball player? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I didn't, I, didn't, I, I, didn't see, I didn't see you there. Can you take off your hood? Um, so part of working together and you know, focusing with solidarity is not only are you building, you know, building relationships, but you're also building power. Because one of the reasons why this movement was successful was because, like I said before, you got people like me, you got people like Robin, um, you've got plenty of other folks who all have different faces. It's literally like it literally was like the uh, Michael Jackson black or white video where they have the face montage. Oh. Well, you should watch it. It's great. There's this whole scene where like Tyra Banks turns into this Japanese dude, and it's and it's, it's seamless. Um, but it's it's all about the same thing. We're all working together. Um, High School Musical. We're all in this together. I find myself. I don't even like that movie, but I find myself saying that more. So one of the things that um, I feel really proud of to have come out of this is there is a um, there is a, a, a coalition of folks who came to get together in order to stand up for folks like myself who were, for the most part, incapacitated. Um, and there were threats, and there still are threats, of white nationalists coming to the city. And they were here. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you know, right now, Matthew Hunt was here not too long ago. These are very real threats, and I am not going to sit here and say that I was about to be on the front lines trying to punch a Nazi. That was not going to happen to me. But I'm really proud that the same, through the same work, through the same organizing, that there were members of different groups who banded together with the sole purpose of focusing on how to resist white supremacy. Whether it comes in the fact of actually people coming to the city or from an institutional standpoint. And, you know, I, I wish I could sit here and say that these things aren't going to happen, but they, but they, but they might. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we cannot be afraid. We need to stand together um, and be united as a people to say, "Get out of our town." Um, Bob Marley saw him crazy bald head. I got to chase this crazy bald head out of my town. You all should listen to that. It's a good, um, it's a good workout song. Um, but also within building the coalition. It also allows for this message that you have to be spread, not just to one audience. So when you had KFTC, when you had Kentucky Workers League, when you had the NAACP, all I had to do was say, hey, we're doing this. Can you all send out an email? And sure, there were people that were probably on both of those lists. But there is an entire group of people that might not have seen it if they didn't, you know, if they weren't connected. And so it just made the message spread a little bit better. Um, so, lessons learned. Um, have someone document the events. I know that for the most of the young people in the room, I would assume that you all usually have your phones on, so <laughs> keep doing that. Um, I am not, I'm artistic in the sense of being a musician, but uh, I'm not going to sit here and take pictures, and if it weren't for certain people taking pictures, we wouldn't have proof that this existed. Case in point, remember that sit-in that I told you about in 1959? The Lexington Herald Leader didn't cover the Civil Rights Movement at all, and they didn't apologize until like 2010. <laughs> um, and the only reason why we even know that the sit-ins happened are because there were pictures of them taken by uh, a photographer named Calvert McCann, whose brother was Les McCann, the jazz piano player, dollar <laughs> into that. Um, and also, like, understand the rules. Like, there are folks who can be police liaisons when you're at a rally to make sure that, not, not only to make sure that you, know, that you are safe, but also that there's an understanding of 
How long is this going to be? You know, like if something gets riled up, who do you have to go to to say, hey, we got this, it's okay, or hey, we need you to come over here. Um, not everything is going to go as planned. We had these t-shirts and they're awesome. They're extremely comfortable. I was so excited that we got t-shirts and we had t-shirts for the longest time. And then as soon as the city council meeting happened and everybody wanted a t-shirt, we didn't have any. So it is what it is. Um, trust your team. Michael Jordan might say it differently, but he didn't win a championship without Scotty Pippen. He didn't win a championship without the folks on his team that he could trust. LeBron James wouldn't win a championship if it were not for Dwayne Wade or Kyrie Irving. You know, not to use basketball analogies, but I mean, use a Star Wars analogy. If during the Battle of Geonosis in Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, if Anakin Skywalker had listened to Obi Wan when he said they were fighting Count Dooku, and he said, "We'll take him together," and Anakin's like, "Nah, I got him," he would still have his arm. Anyways. People will engage in a way in which they um, feel comfortable. I said that before. So just because you think that this is a bad idea, don't 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 rain on don't rain on somebody's parade. Um, and also, not everyone is at your level. One of the things that I said at the vigil that happened right after Charlottesville here in Lexington, where microaggression aside, uh, another friend of mine, Keenan, is a very light-skinned African American was just standing there and someone said, hey, Cabron, are you ready to speak? Can I just point out, Keenan's also my size. Yeah. So he's, he's not, he's not uh, yeah, microaggressions are great. Uh, but not everyone is at, but not, not everyone is at your level. And so while there are people who after the election have just been woken up to like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. It's not on us to judge, but, well, I'm all the way over here and you're just not figuring it out. It's more, Welcome to the party. Let's catch you up to speak. And, um, you know, understand that trains do matter. Uh, and allowing, you know, even going to a train, even if you think you, you know everything, you don't. Um, and in the words of the great philosopher Christopher Wallace, if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> um, and allow others to celebrate while staying on task. Um, that was something that was hard for me especially after the city council meeting, my phone was like flooding with messages and I'm over here trying to hide because white supremacists want to kill me. Um, you know, but a lot of people to have that moment because without hope, you're not going to move it forward. So I knew that it wasn't, I, I knew that I believed in this cause and I was willing to die for this cause. I very much so was. Um, but again, not everybody is me, and not everybody is at the same level. So if somebody wants to celebrate because the city council voted unanimously on a Tuesday work session to, um, to, to, to remove the statue, or to remove the statues, let them celebrate, but then come correct and have a press conference and say, okay, the Herald Leader misinformed all of you all, it's not over yet, but we're, we're, we're almost there. Um, and, you know, stay on task. Co-optation will happen. Oh, I don't have enough time to talk about this. Just like rock and roll, jazz, bluegrass, and all the other things black people invented, it's whatever you do is going to get co-opted. Um, most people that I've talked to about this have no idea that we were an actual organization. Uh, they think Jim Gray just waved his magic hand and made all this happen. Um, there were people that came swooping in and said, we're going to make a fund to help pay to remove the statues. And it's going to be amazing. And yada, 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 we, we take, you know, Mitch Landry and blah, 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 blah. And then you're sitting there like, where were you two years ago? And why did you not call me? And so even when you try to fix it and you get to a point where the fund is now called the Take Back Chief Side Relocation Fund. <laughs> Still, in the news and in the Herald Leader, things say, oh, the Bluegrass Community Foundation put together this fund. 
And one thing that I, uh, that I believed in the beginning of this is that I didn't care that anybody knew my name, I didn't care that anybody knew Take Back Cheap Side. All I wanted is that this change was going to happen. But you know what? Representation matters. And the reason why I love Lando Calrissian, not because he's the coolest brother in the galaxy, but it's because he was the first person that I saw and I was like, oh, that guy looks like me. I like him. So the important thing is, sure, people don't know my name. Don't really care. They get it wrong half the time anyways. They don't really need to know to take my chief side. What they do need to know, though, is that this happened because of grassroots organizing. And it's something that every single person in this room is capable of doing and capable of showing up for in some way or fashion. Um, sure, I'm a charismatic guy, and I also find irony in playing and being a guitar player and playing Dixie and being a black man and having people look at me real weird because uh, I do it to, to bring attention to the fact that, like, yeah, the song's oppressive. Um, but you have to use your platform in the way that you can in order to make change. And so that's why all the folks who are vilifying Colin Kaepernick right now, um, you know, erasure. Go watch, I would just say, go watch the um, Jay-Z's video, Moonlight, and look at it from the lens of, essentially, Moonlight won Best Picture. But you know what everybody's going to remember? Oh, man, remember when Warren Beatty got the name wrong and La La Land won? It's like we can't have nothing. <laughs> And always keep your messaging consistent, because the last thing that you want is to have some person spitting craziness, saying that they're part of you, um, and understand that the, you know, the importance of this is what we want, and this is how we're going to get it. Um, and your work matters. Getting hugged in the middle of a protest is probably one of the most amazing feelings. I actually, I will say this, one of my favorite moments that happened during a protest I was, I, was trying, I was totally trying to be Fred Hampton. I was walking around with this sign, I was like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, take back cheap side. And there's this person that's like, oh, you want some kettle corn? I'm like, yes, yes, I do want some kettle corn. <laughs> Black Lives Matter. <laughs> um, but your work matters. And one of the things that I hope that I can do with this is to inspire everyone in this room. Because, um, you know, this work happens because of the power of people. And we have to give the power back to the people, and that's why the Panther Party said all power to the people. Not just power to the people, all power to the people. Um, and so our next steps, uh, we're going to make sure that these statues go to the cemetery, use the, the sponge to help reimagine the space, uh, narrow down specifics of where to have this um, community conversation, raise funds for the future of the campaign, give talks on the campaign, help facilitate workshops, and uh, we're gonna build a toolkit. And I, I really appreciate this picture, Robin took this picture, but this is the, the one, the, the day that the, the, the statues came down, Russell um, was like, man, why aren't we gonna take our civil rights picture? And I was like, yeah, whatever. And I was like, well, I mean, they still got those steps there. Um, and, um, you know, we want to focus on more community events and have to continue to use this power uh, to uplift other things that are going on in town. Because like, this is not just the only form of racism. Racism isn't over because these statues are gone. We still got a lot of a lot of work to do. Um, so before I uh, I answer questions, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate having the time to be here. Uh, when I was a student at, at the University of Kentucky, I mean, still to this day, I walk. Because uh, I, you know, I work at the radio station. I walk, and it, I, I, on the flags of you know famous um, <laughs> famous people that went to this university, uh, we don't see very many people of color that um, aren't athletes. And I want to tell every single person in this room right now: don't let that discourage you, because you can be the first person to be on one of those flags. Every single person in this room is capable of doing it. All you have to do is believe in yourself and continue to work hard. Things are going to suck. Like, I spent two years of my life trying to record a record. And a month after, or a month after I released the record, I broke my pinky. What are you going to do? Things are going to happen. If I didn't do physical therapy, I wouldn't be able to play guitar again. So keep your eyes on the prize and keep moving forward. So, anyway.
I didn't actually talk for an hour, so ha! Uh, are there any are there any questions? Okay. We have first Ten or more questions. Yeah, are there, uh, are you talk about any personal consequences of taking a stand in social activism? Sure. Um, can you repeat the question? He said, can I, can, I, uh, make a, can I make a reference to talk about the consequences of taking a stand? Um, so because I have, I receive death threats, uh, I suffer from some pretty severe PTSD. Um, I don't go out at night because sometimes I go to places and I start having panic attacks. Um, and it is, you know, being on the radar of, of people like that. Um, it's, uh, it's scary and it's frustrating, but I know I'm not the only person that's had to do it. And every single time someone comes up to me and says, thank you, it makes up for all of the stress that I have to deal with. So if I got to talk to a trauma therapist and try to work <laughs> through this, you know, it's it's worth it because we got the statues moved. Yes. How did you get around the governor's commission, military commission? Uh, okay. So the quick answer is, we uh, there was actually a panel that. Uh, Dr. Kerwood spoke on, and there was a, a woman there who was, a, I like to call her the final piece. Her name is Emily Bergeron. And she talked about how um, you could circumvent um, a, a commission like that by saying, you know, hate speech is part of the First Amendment. But essentially what happened was we showed the mayor all that information as to how if the city were to be sued, they could still win their case uh, and remove the statues. And so they took that and spoke to um, Attorney General Andy Bashir, and he said, well, because these papers were not the... So in 2003, when the statues were put under the commission, Mayor Teresa Isaacs signed them without getting the city council to vote on it. So it was a loophole. Um, and that's how the statues are gone. Uh, that's not saying that that's going to be the end of it, and that's not saying that somebody's not going to say something, but for the short end of the story is that's how it happened. So we've run into that same problem trying to remove the Jefferson Davis monument from the rotunda, mm -hmm. because that is officially signed, and the governor's already said it's not leaving. So we haven't been able to get around the the military commission. So it's under the protection of the Military Heritage Commission? Interesting. Well, the process essentially for what would have to happen is that whoever is in charge of it, so I don't, I mean, at least within the city limits, the statutes were still under the protection of the city, so the city was the one that, could, that would have to apply to the Military Heritage Commission, um, and the Military Heritage Commission needs 30 days to review their um, the application. So. If it's in Frankfurt, I would I guess I would assume that it would be the people probably be under the governor. But I'm the most obtrusive thing about that about the statue is really for me, for me is the plaque because it's it's wrong. It calls him a hero, patriot, and statesman, and it's it's not true. Um, are you going to the meeting on the 14th? Actually, it's the 29th. I'll probably be there. But uh, the thing is, they're saying that uh, he's has no reason to be in the room. He wasn't. Nobody really knows why he's there. When you ask the question why is he there, you really don't get an answer. Yeah. So that's that's not a fight with people one another. <laughs> you want to keep your skills sharp. You know, one of the one of the most one of the most like racist things that I've heard that's not actually a slur since I moved here is, well that's tradition. I'm like, why is there an alarmant when I came on campus? I'm like, why are there still why is there still a black Mr. or Mrs. UK and then a Mr. or Mrs. UK? Well that's tradition. Tradition's got to change, y'all. Like, <laughs> and so people that's in this cold. room. Tradition is cold. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, we know why he's there. But yeah, the whole white supremacy. I mean, the answer, the answer is white supremacy. Um, but you can't just say white supremacy without trying to have a solution.
Yes. Um, so like we're just curious. I was like, I was like, dedication. Like I was just like, dedication. Like I was just learning. I'm sorry. What was the question? Like the student of like the school learning. The students involved. Oh, uh, um, yes and no. There were high school students that were involved in the very, 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 very beginning. Um, but I had, uh, when Sean King came to speak with Bobby Seal, um, I tried to talk to some of the members of the NAACP chapter here. I never followed followed back. But I, I'm working. My other job is I am a organizer apprentice with the Kentucky Commonwealth, and I'm working to come and help lift, uplift some of the work that other organizations like uh, Underground Perspectives, I guess is one of the groups that's on, on, here on campus. Um, I really would like to come and use the skills that I have uh, to help teach workshops or you know, uplift any of the, of the kind of work that's already happening on campus. So if you would like to send me an email, uh, we, can make, we can make that happen and we can, and, and we can talk. Because I, I, I really feel that um, you know, it's an important thing to engage the community. And when I was on UK's campus, I never felt like I was part of Lexington's. I never, I, you know, I didn't feel like Lexington really cared about me. Yes. There was a restaurant over on South Broadway called the Jefferson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was there any type of protesting or, or accident that went on? So the, open there. the the justification was that originally where Bombay, or no, not Bombay, what's it called? The Indian restaurant that's right across the street from South Bar, or South Sound Bar. That building and the very in the very uh, in the in the uh, attic, Jefferson Davis actually lived there. And that was the home of the original Jefferson Davis Inn. And it was named because Jefferson Davis lived there. This other bar that was bought on South Broadway, um, was bought by some people who were fans of the bar and decided to name it JDI. And so they asked me to play, and I said, well, you know, I'll, I'd be more than happy to, to play there when you change the name of your establishment. Um, and what was it called? The Jefferson Davis Inn. Oh. Yeah. Um, so here you have the power of white supremacy was that they literally were like, well, no, no, no. it's JDI, not Jefferson Davis Inn. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> And that place is closed, so <laughs> there's, there's that. Yes? I don't have a question, uh, but I, I want to thank you. And uh, I keep up with things in Kentucky. I live in Mexico. Okay. But there were two segments of a very nice news program called Vice News, where the man great yeah. was talking like this was his mission. <laughs> right. Man. Yeah. I love, see, my favorite thing about that is the one person from our coalition that got on the documentary is not and he wouldn't he if, if you were to ask him you know about it he would not be he would he was, he's not going to jump out and say yeah take back cheap side it's just funny because he was originally like not particularly a fan of the logo because it intimidated him but uh <laughs> but like you know he's a very like he's a very introverted person so yeah it was just kind of funny that that situation happened and the erasure of that is that that only focused on what happened at the tuesday work session even though they were at the Thursday city council meeting where the statutes were actually voted on. Uh, yeah. So it was a good time for him because the nation was talking about yeah. moving those bonds. Yeah. Twice. Vice mm -hmm. News is a very fine program. Mm -hmm. It comes on HBO. And yeah. other places, but it made it seem like this is. Well, let me let me say this before um, I, you know, I wrap up. I, I, I want to say that you know the importance of this work is also on the fact that you know how many people had to die for this to finally be changed. The entire conversation completely changed because a white woman named Heather, Heather Heyer was killed in Charlottesville. So that's privilege within itself, that people were upset, but gonna sit here and say that Philando Castile shouldn't have, you know, he, he, if he had done everything right, he would have been okay. Or if Michael Brown didn't look like a thug, or if Sandra Bland wasn't speeding, so this is all part of the same conversation, right? So we have, to, we have to recognize that we do live within a white supremacist power structure. And the only way we can continue to defeat it is by pointing it out and working to make the change. <coughs> One last thing. Yes. You're right, because you mentioned Emmett Till at the beginning of your presentation. And uh, there have been conversations 
a conversation that was had with Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. She did not get up because she was tired. She had an interesting thing about Emmett Till. And that's why she sat, and that was the beginning well, Claudette Colvin did that six months before, but yeah, yeah. She did that. Well, because she was tired. Right. Because of that, too. Right. And, you know, the whole thing with that, with the, I can't even remember her name, Ann Bryant came out and said that nothing even actually, nothing even actually happened. The boy died for nothing. So. Yeah. And also, Parks had been a very uh, anti-rape activist for yeah. years before that. And you know there are plenty of other people that are lost to the annals of history, like Mayor Rustin, who was the organizer of the uh, march, uh, the march on Washington. He was an openly gay black man who had been organizing all the way into the forties. Um, and anyways, so this is why it's important to know your history. So um, I think that is. I got one minute. Anybody else have one last question? Any burning questions? <laughs> You're just determined to break that hand. Again, yeah. yeah. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you to all of you.